Please go to your church. Um, just again, Thursday Thursday night, pr- um, churches at 7 o'clock. We always have a prayer one hour before service if you guys would like to come over. Um, again, if you are sick, if you have any symptoms of sneezing, coughing, runny nose, please take the precautions. We advise you not to show up. We don't want anybody to be worried or anything. Um, there is going to be no nursery for little kids. It's going to be closed unless you are a nursing mother. Um, we ask that you use sanitizer as you walk into the building. If you don't feel comfortable, there is hand sanitizer in the back as well. Um, that is all the announcements today. Let's give God praise as Pastor Fred comes. This way.
Amen. Hallelujah. Good to be in the house of God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Awesome privilege, amen, to do the will of God, amen, and take up the offering this evening. Many of us, amen, being Christians and like-minded, we know Acts 20, verse 35, it says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so a lot of people, amen, and knowing that scripture, uh, sometimes don't have an understanding, but I want to illustrate it through a story. There's an old story that goes like this. An unusual tree grew outside the gates of a desert city in the Middle East. It was an old tree, a landmark as a matter of fact. It seemed to have been touched by the finger of God for it bore fruit perpetually. Despite its old age, its limbs were constantly laden with fruit. Hundreds of passers-by refreshed themselves from the tree as it never fell to give freely. But then a greedy merchant purchased the property on which the tree grew. He saw hundreds of travelers robbing his tree, and he built a high fence around it. The travelers pleaded, share with us. The merchant quoted in return, it's my tree, my fruit, bought with my money. And then a strange thing happened. The old tree died. What had happened? The law of giving. As predictable as the law of gravity had expressed its immutable principle. When a tree stops giving, it stops bearing, and it dies. Yes, this story illustrates well the law of give and receive. And many times when I think of how much I take from God's world, I bow in guilt at how little I give to his work. See, Acts 20, verse 35 says, It's more blessed to give and give to receive. And when you have an understanding of the scripture, just like this tree, God designed men and women, humanity, to give. Whether it's finances, whether it's of your time, whether it's just, just giving of yourself. This is why I truly believe that when, especially the older folk, whenever they retire, have you ever noticed that the ones that stop doing something, they pass away? But the ones that usually get a part-time job or give back, volunteer, give into the community, they keep living vibrantly because of this very law. And so I encourage you, amen, to give tonight into the kingdom of God, having this understanding, amen, that once we stop giving, it's easier to not give next time. And then the next time. And then eventually, amen, I'm not going to say that you're going to die, but you will die spiritually because you're not giving back into the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, But this I say, he that sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. The command of the law of giving and receiving of that, it's better to give because you know what? It's an automatic benefit. When you give, especially into the kingdom of God, he always gives back. We serve a faithful God. Can you say amen? amen? God has given us life. He has designed us. But then he also gave his son because he saw what happened with sin. And the whole reason that we pull offering, amen, is that, you know what? We are listener supported. Like Caleb or whatever that station used to be. We are listener supported. Where we don't have no government grants. We don't have these things, these programs going on. We go with the listener. If they feel God, if they hear God, we expect you to obey. Because this understanding should be here is that it's better to give than receive. And I've seen it countless times in my life that the more I gave, I was just blown away of like what God is giving back. And I even can attest it now to a lot of what we have in the church that we're pioneering on the northwest side. And my pastor has even encouraged me with this, is that the reason you have what you have is because you are faithful in giving. I'm not just talking about finances either. Faithful in supporting the work. Outreaches, concerts, revivals, any play, any whatever was dreamed up was faithful. And God has been giving us people that are the same way, having that same heart. And so if you want God to move in your life, I encourage you to give. Not just here in finances. I want to go beyond this. 
Because for this church to survive, for this church to be revived, it takes the heart of men to join together and give and have this understanding that it's better to give than to receive. Because it's an automatic benefit with God. You give, watch, you'll you'll receive. So let's give amen tonight as the uh, Brother Kyrie, amen, will pray for the offering. May you live the life. May you live the life that I should live. May you die the death that I should die. Amen. From our house, a year in our house. Amen. Um, um, preaching the gospel in our house and then moving into this building. Amen. Which actually used to be a fellowship church. If y'all didn't know that at one time, this building right here was a fellowship church. Amen. Amen. Now we've moved into it. Amen. We've taken over. Amen. And you know what? God, we're seeing God do miracle things. Amen. Great things. Amen. Amen. Just want to thank you guys for coming in. It's good. Um, Evangelist Scott Stone, a round of applause. Uh, a Texas Longhorn, amen. A round of applause. Amen. Good morning. Amen. We're going to take him to go eat a steak today, amen. Oh, on my bad. Yeah, we got special music. Amen. But he's coming up here anyway. I wasn't going to say Amen. He gripped that microphone too. I started taking it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Tish. I want to thank God for my salvation and all that He's done. I thought that was a sign because this day has been really bad. And so I thought, okay, God just doesn't want us to do this. No, then I forgot the music. <laughs> and so luckily my son brought his. <laughs> and they can share because they're Christians. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll still be saved after this. No. <laughs> but I gave my life to Christ like 18 years ago. And I grew actually grew up in this fellowship and had the awesome privilege to get a foundation in my life as a child. From the age of seven, we, um, we converted from being Catholic to um, uh, being Christian. <laughs> and the... Uh, it was the best decision, but I never really surrendered my all to Christ. So having that foundation there, I just never really um, surrendered or, or gave my all to Christ. And so I found myself at the age of 23, I was already um, divorced. Um, I was already depressed, lonely, and I was blaming all my failed marriage, my lack of happiness and joy all on God, but throughout this whole time, I was going to church. 
I was faithful to church. And so if you're in here and you are doing that, you're going through the motions, you're going to church, but you don't have that true relationship with God, you still need God. And no matter what I did through all of that of going to church, I was still fornicating. Going to church, I was still drinking. Going to church, I was still doing drugs. Going to church, I was still doing all these worldly things. And so when I finally got saved, I thought God would never forgive me of those things because I knew better. And um, this song that we're about to sing, it, it hits on that. God doesn't love us less. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So that means that even though um, we were out there doing whatever we were doing, and we knew better that he still died for us and he still has a plan for our lives and he'll never love us any less. He still wants us to come to him. And that's that's really what the song is about. Oh, <laughs> 
wet pants are on the shelf. <laughs> he did that one without pants. That won't be on that. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Let's take a moment and give Jesus some praise together. Uh, Father, we thank you and we lift you up, my God. We exalt you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. My God, you are holy, Lord. And you are mighty, God. There truly is none like you, Lord. You're the beginning and the end, oh Lord. I feel your face, you're my faith, oh my God. Shenna Baha, Rabba Baba, Sunday, and Rabba, Sunday, and Rabba, Sunday, and Holy, holy is your name, O Lord. Shena ba 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 yo 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 se ke ni 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 on a Tuesday, come on somebody. Before Jesus, who would have ever thought about going to church on a Tuesday? Come on now. If you would turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. While you're turning there, I'm going to read James 5, 16. It says this, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, when we read this, uh, people tend to get caught up in the confession part of it. Well, I mean, i got to tell somebody else what I've done. What he's really talking about is praying for one another. We're confessing things that we need help with. We're telling each other what we need help with, and then we're going to pray. But look at what he says here. He, he says that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual means producing or able to produce a desired effect. Now, that's an empowering definition right there. It will produce, but it's able to produce. That means when you and I begin to wonder, are my prayers really going to touch God? The answer is yes, because you and I have the ability to touch God if our prayers are effectual and fervent. Those two have to go together. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent means having or showing great emotion or zeal. It means extremely hot or glowing. Who thinks about their prayer life as hot? and glowing. Well, uh, if you could describe your prayer life, would you say, my prayer life is hot? <laughs> Most of us would say it's hot because the air conditioner doesn't work in the prayer room. That's the reason we would say it. And we're glowing because the sweat is pouring off of our faces. And it's not because we're petitioning God, it's just because we burn it up. But the fact is, our prayer life should be on fire. Come on, somebody. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I mean, no, we got to be righteous, which means right standing with God. If you and I have Jesus in our hearts, we're forgiven of sin, we're working and living for God, we're trying our level best, you and I can go to God in prayer, and we can touch heaven and change earth with those prayers. And that's our prayer tonight, isn't it? All the people that God used in the Bible knew how to pray. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, they knew how to get a hold of God. When you read Moses' prayer, man, ain't you moved by Moses' prayer? Shoot, when Elijah was praying, I mean, Elijah dumping water on the sacrifice. He's making fun of the prophets of Baal, and then he's dumping water on the sacrifice, and then he prays God to send fire to burn up the sacrifice, and it does. Come on, somebody. That's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man all the way into the New Testament. Tell me that the Apostle Paul did not pray. Everybody that God used knew how to get a hold of God. And that's what prayer is. It's literally getting a hold of God. Pastor Cluck always sings that song, you know, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. You, you just hear him say it. You got Jesus on the main line, you tell him what you want. Right? You can just hear it. And that's what he's talking about. Literally, we have access to God. Prayer is making war in the heavenlies. Come on, somebody. We sing that song, making war in the heavenlies. Casting down on every high thing. How can we cast down anything if we ain't praying? If we're not effectually, fervently praying, how are we going to make war in the heavenlies? And the answer is we can't. In Daniel 10, verses 12 and 13, you can read it for yourself. Daniel's been fasting and praying and trying to get a hold of God. And the angel shows up to him and says, Look, Daniel, from the moment you set your heart, your affections to get the answer from God, it was coming your way. It was going to get here. But for 21 days, the prince of Persia resisted me. A demonic principality kept the prayer from 
from the answer to the prayer from reaching Daniel. He said, so much so that the archangel Michael had to come and help me, or I'd probably still be there. That's making war in the heavenlies. So you need to understand that our prayers touch heaven and that we're making war to get them there and to get the answers that we want. There is a strategy of hell to stop our prayers from connecting with God. Yes, come on. That's demonic assault against the prayer life of God's people. Prayer is the key to victory. Prayer is the key to power. Prayer is the key to revival. Now, if I asked every person in this room, you want revival? Everybody would say, yes, hallelujah. That's why we're here. We want revival. That is why we're here tonight. Yes, we call this a revival, but revival is not a series of church meetings. Revival is a spirit that catches hold of people. It starts with one person becoming the kindling that throws himself on the fire of revival, and then it spreads like a wildfire. Come on, somebody. That's what revival is, and we all want that. But are you and I effectively, fervently praying tonight? Jesus' ministry was filled with all kinds of signs and wonders, miracles of healing and deliverance, the feeding of thousands with a kid's lunch. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. But Jesus' ministry is defined by what supported it. And that's his prayer life. You can look at Jesus and call him a praying man. You can look at Jesus and say he's the greatest prayer warrior that ever walked the planet. He's the greatest servant that ever walked the planet. Nobody prayed better than Jesus did. Nobody prayed more often than Jesus did. Nobody could pray like Jesus Christ. He had a private prayer life. He would go off into the distance by himself and pray. It says that he would get up early in the morning and separate himself from everybody. Sometimes sailing across something just to get where he could pray. Because people were thronging him constantly. Then he would come back and go about his ministry of servitude. And then, after he went to sleep, or when he was in the, the house at night, or wherever he was staying, it said that they would bring the demonically possessed people to him late at night. Thanks a lot. Yeah, right. You know, like, couldn't you bring your demon-possessed cousin at noon? Would it have killed you? You know, you have to wait till at night. But see, that's the thing. The ministry never sleeps. And Jesus knew he's got to pray in order to do the things that God had called him to do, which is be an example to you and I on what, how to pray, how to live, how to teach, how to rebuke devils, how to lay hands on the sick that they should recover, and how to meet the needs of a lost and dying generation. He had a corporate prayer life. Can you not pray with me one hour? Are you... You're sleeping. Wake up. Can't you just pray with me for an hour? He wanted people to pray with him. He had a private prayer life and a corporate prayer life. If you and I are going to see revival, we're going to have to rededicate ourselves to prayer. Amen. God's people must pray. Amen. God's church must pray. Second Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from where? Heaven. And I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Come on, somebody. If my people who are called by my name, hello, Christians, somebody, if we will humble ourselves and pray, then God will hear our prayers from heaven, and He will answer. Hallelujah. Prayer is humility. It's hard to be prideful when you're on your knees in prayer. Any man who spends much time in prayer can cast down his ego, hello somebody. Because in prayer, it's revealed to us how much we need God. How desperate we are for Him. And when we don't pray, we miss out on that. I'll go so far as to say that prayer is an art that needs to be perfected. It's a, it's a piece of art that's never done. And we should be adding things to it. We should never look at our prayer life and say, up oh, this far, no farther gone as far as we can go. Can't pray any better than that. Can't pray any more effectively than that. Can't pray more fervently than that. See, we're never, or we should never, feel like we've reached that point. Our prayer life should constantly be growing, hello somebody, because prayer is our lifeline. We're able to pray to God because of Jesus dying on the cross. We're able to pray in His name without the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus, we could not access God. Wow. Consider that for just a moment. And now think about our prayer lives. Are we taking that seriously? Because to be honest with you, if we're not praying, 
effectively, fervently, if we're not committing ourselves and dedicating ourselves to prayer, we are literally ignoring the sacrifice of Jesus. Because he came to live, die, and live again, that you and I could have access to the very throne of God. To the throne room of God. I will hear from heaven if my people will pray. And Jesus Christ is the name through which you and I access the Father. There is no other name under heaven and earth that you and I can be saved. And no one comes to the Father but by me, says Jesus Christ. Man, we ought to be taking every opportunity to pray. I mean, we ought to be praying from the minute we crack our eyes open to the minute we go to sleep. I don't know about you, but I've had to do war in my sleep. I've been praying in my sleep before. You ever been assaulted in your sleep and you can't talk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking, Jesus, just as loud as I can. Hallelujah. And God begins to move. You and I should pray without ceasing. So I want to look at the greatest prayer warrior who ever walked the planet. I want to preach a sermon called Praying Like a Boss. Come on now. <laughs> Out of John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I want to look first at how Jesus prayed for himself in relation to others. That's how Jesus prayed for himself. Let's read it. Chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast gavest me to do. And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You know, when I was reading this, uh, I, I actually began to cry because that, that verse 5 really touched me. Because here's Jesus, and he's saying, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world even was. There's Jesus saying, I was, God, I was with you from the very beginning. God, I was there when the world was formed. I was there when man was created. I was there when Satan fell. I was there when all this began to start. And God, I'm getting ready to come back to that place. Consider that Jesus decided that he would come down. And he decided to fulfill the work of God on planet Earth. He, he said, I was perfect, but I'll go down there. Think about that, man. I, it just grabbed me. Here he is. And he's literally asking. He's, he's not praying, Lord, bless my socks off. He's not praying that. Lord, give me lots of money. God, finally, punish these people who've been giving me such a hard time. Pharisees. Puff of smoke. God. Ah. Romans, I get it. sand fleas, all of them. <laughs> yeah, baby. You know, he could have prayed that, but he didn't. What he's praying is that, God, will you just let people see you in me? Can I just glorify you? I've been doing the work. I've been doing what you've asked me to do. But God, my, my sole desire here, because he knew what was coming, I'm getting ready to be arrested. I'm getting ready to go to the cross. I'm getting ready to die for the sins of the world, God. But I'm asking that through it all, would you still glorify me, that you may be glorified. God, let all that I do point to you, my God. Let who I am point to you, God, because I'm nothing without you. This is what Jesus is saying. He's praying to God. And saying, God, help me to move the people on the planet, the ones you sent me to serve. Now, God, now let them see your light shining in me. Prayer is our electrical outlet. Look at these. We know there's power in there. We know there is. But what good is it if we never plug anything in and turn it on? What good is it if we don't access the power? What good is it to have the access to God? Literally, the outlet to God, the plug-in to God, to know where all the energy flows spiritually and eternally, to know that all we got to do, whoo, 
got to do is just simply plug in such as we are. It doesn't matter if we got a dim bulb. Hallelujah. doesn't matter if we got dust on it. doesn't matter if we ain't plugged it in in years. We can plug it in it instantly. God will hear from heaven and we can glorify Him with who we are and who He is in us. Hallelujah. It's our spiritual ID. Yes, it's how we get the blood transfusion. The blood of the cross transfusion. Our prayer life, I dare say, needs some resurrection life spoken into it. Because I know I'm not the only one that gets slothful in prayer. Come on now. Been hitting on this a little bit this week because God is trying to tell me something. And he's trying to tell you something. He's trying to tell us something. Not because he's mad, but because he wants us to get desperate for more of him. Because there is a lost and dying world out there. And they need to see the difference in us, they need to see the light. Come on now. You and I have got to double down on our prayers. It's not enough to simply throw up a few hallelujahs and a, and a few glory to God's. It's not enough. Listen, I, I've, been, I've been saved 20 years, and I'll tell you something. Anytime I start really, really, really going through something, it's because my prayer life ain't where it should be. I've been phoning it in. You ever phoned your prayer life in? Come on now. Come yeah, on. come on. Come on. Come on. People yawning in tongues in the prayer room. Come on. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Come into the come into the prayer room and walk. Amen. And thank God for walking. Listen, I have to walk, I have to sit down, I have to kneel, I have to do all of it so I don't get in a rut. Come on. Because you know we walk. We start walking because I need to I need to excite my prayer life. So here we start walking. I've done it. You know, God, you gotta move it over, oh, feeling it, and God's moving. God, you're just gonna have to, and Lord, you're just gonna have to. Oh yeah, God, you're just gonna. Woo! And then we're getting all excited. And next thing you know, wow. Wow. <laughs> in the prayer room, thinking, just thinking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right? Because brother coming the other way, just thinking. You know, brother past each other. People were to walk into that prayer room, they'd be like, what is going on? <laughs> it's the walking dead. <sighs> right? <laughs> and so we sit down and we say, okay, I need to focus. <laughs> Father, Lord, God, you're just going to have to move. Oh, yeah, this is what I've been missing. God, you're going to have to come down, oh, Lord. Lord, I'm, I'm drawing a circle around this chair, and when you pour out your spirit, let revival take place in this circle, God, that it may spread. Hallelujah! <laughs> and then the next day... <clears throat> come on, I've been there. Come on, man. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. See, you and I are responsible for our prayer life. You and I are responsible for resuscitating our prayer life. You and I are responsible for calling upon the heavenly paddles to come down and yell, clear, and bring the prayer life back to life. Come on, somebody. You and I have to access God. And we need to turn our prayer life to the way Jesus is turning his. God, people need to see you in me. I want to look secondly at he prayed for his followers' effectiveness. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are mine. Go down to verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now here's... Jesus praying for his men. He's praying for the ones that he personally chose and, and, and began to train. And you know, if you notice, Jesus never once taught the men how to preach. 
He didn't say, when you preach, preach thusly. It was always, when you pray, pray like this. When you step into a city, pray for the sick. Cast out demons in my name. Meet the needs of the people and the lost and the dying there. Reflect me. And through that, they learn to preach. Are you with me? Because seeing people's needs is what preaching is all about. It's why these things get preached. It's why a pastor preaches the sermon he preaches. It's because God has given it to him so that the people may be fed, so that they may be able to go out and preach the gospel. It's fine if you're going to let your little light shine, but you know, you got to put some volume behind it. What good's a light show if there ain't no sound? Come on, somebody. He's praying that his men should not be taken out of the world. That translates into us. He's praying that we should not be taken out of the world, but that we should be effective in the world that we live in right now. Jesus is talking about currently. Yes, this may have been a long time ago, but how many know he's talking about currently? He's talking about just such a time as this. This present darkness is what you and I are called to pray through. No matter what time period his followers live in. How many times have you heard lately, oh, this is... Man, this is a tough generation. These are some pretty entrenched sins now. There's some pretty aggressive spirits out there taking control. Well, aren't all evil spirits aggressive? Haven't they always been? I saw Satan fall like lightning. That's pretty aggressive, man. Right? He's called the father of lies. That's pretty aggressive. The spirits that are running roughshod over a dying generation right now are the same spirits that were running roughshod then. But these men were raised up to combat those, come on somebody. Jesus is praying for his followers to sanctify themselves. He said, I don't want to pray that you take them out of the world. I just want to pray that you keep them free from living in it. You know, we have, well, we have to be in it, but not of it. In other words, not defined by the world's standards. In other words, we're supposed to look different than the world. Not carry ourselves as if we better, come on somebody. Oh, you know, I've been saved, praise the Lord. And therefore, I am God's gift to thou. How many know that's not what Jesus is talking about? <laughs> Jesus said, I just want you to be sanctified, set apart for the good work that I have called you to, to be in the world but not of it. Set apart from the world that we may win people from it. Come on, somebody. They look to us and go, what's going on in you that you're not impacted by all this stuff that's killing my family? Well, it's Jesus. It's Christ and Him crucified. It's the standards of God. Ah, later for all that. Okay, later for all that. Let me know when you're ready. And then we go to the next person. Because somebody is going to receive it. And when they receive it, their life is going to change. But if nobody's carrying the call in this lost and dying world because we think the spirits are somehow more wicked than you and I can handle, then something's wrong. Jesus was praying for his men to stand in the midst of adversity. He prayed for his followers' effectiveness in the world. If you look at Matthew 16, verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in the heaven. See, he's telling Peter right here, he's not saying, Peter, you're going to be the church. You're not saying, Peter, you're going you're gonna to be the, the basis upon which all the kingdom of God rests on. He's not saying that at all. He's saying simply because you have recognized who I am and the power that brings a believer, you are going to be able to stand and storm the very gates of hell, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Isaiah talks about turning the battle at the gate. He's talking about the gate of the city. Jesus is referring to this in Peter. He's saying, because you know who I am. Because you know what kind of power walking around in me. Because you know that I am God in the flesh. Because you know me 
personally because you have stated it, you have confessed it, and you are living by it. Hallelujah. That upon that faith will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter, you're going to be able to pray. And the power that you get from that prayer, because you know who I am, you're going to be able to bind, and it shall be bound, not just on earth, but in the heavenlies. Hallelujah. You will be able to loose. Not just here on earth, but in the heavenly saints of God. Are you seeing the power that we have? Simply because we know who Jesus is. And we declare him as Lord and Savior. And he is more, well, he's more powerful than anything that's going on out there. Don't you dare tell me that my Jesus cannot take what's going on out there. That's your Jesus. That's my Jesus. And that's who we're praying through. Come on, somebody. Talk about power. We can pray in the name of Jesus and make things happen. I was talking about revival. Who wants revival? Well, I want revival. Then we can make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Only God gives revival, brother. <laughs> <laughs> man. Man, loosen the top button of your shirt. Oh, oh man. He's choking the oxygen off of your spiritual brain. It is time to recognize that Jesus just gave us the authority oh, to bind and yeah. loose and provoke revival right. through our prayers. Yeah. Well, we can't make people serve God. No, but we can pray them in. We can pray against the demonic forces that have set up a stronghold in their lives. The stronghold of pornography, lust, perversion, anger, violence, pride, even apathy. Yes, we can pray against indifference, and indifference will go away. People can care because you and I are praying. Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. I would rather you be cold or hot. I wondered about that for a long time. Why would Jesus say, I'd rather you be cold on anything? Because he knew that whenever cold and hot come in conflict with each other, guess what there's going to be? Conflict! Yeah. That means people are going to be talking. You're going to be witnessing. The unbeliever is going to be going, blah, 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 science, 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 evolution, science, big bang, blah, 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 blah. And you're going to be over here going, no, but I got, I got... Jesus in my heart, and this is what he did. He took the needle out of my vein, or he kept me from putting a needle in it. Hallelujah. And we may not move each other off of our belief, but everybody that's standing around, everybody that's listening in that moment, they're being impacted by the cold, or they're being impacted by the hot. That means people will get saved. For everybody that doesn't get saved, somebody got to get saved, because you and I are praying and functioning in the effectiveness of fervent prayer. Mom. I want to look lastly at Jesus prayed for you. Yes, he did. Look in verse 20 of our text. John chapter 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me. And I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So in this moment, Jesus was praying for you and I personally, for those who would believe in the future, because of the preaching of the men that I have raised up to myself, Peter. James, John, all of these men that he chose, they preached, and we're reading from the book of John tonight. We're believing because of, we know Jesus to be true. None of us were there when Jesus died on the cross, were we? Oh, but we believe it, don't we? None of us were there when the stone was rolled away and Jesus came back to life or when he appeared to them after death. None of us were there, but oh, we believe it, don't we? And we believe it because of the testimony of those that were there and the testimony of those that were moved by their preaching and the testimony of those that were moved by their preaching. It's a heritage. It's a lineage. It's a family line of Christianity that goes all the way back to the men that Jesus chose personally. And now he's praying for you and me. God, I pray for Akeem. Father, I pray for Giovanni. Father, I, I pray for Pastor Marcos. He's going to fight hell when he gets to the city I've, I've selected for him. Father, for Pastor Larry, who's going to 
dig in in Midwest City and begin to do a, a work for God, for Pastor Sean, who's, who's going to be known as Pastor Patience. <laughs> because I'm going to send him disciples that will make him lose his hair. <laughs> Are you with me? See, everybody in here could insert your name right there. Jesus was praying for us just before he went to the cross. How personal does it need to get for you and I to be moved by the prayers of Jesus Christ for you and I? His prayer is that none should perish. That people would believe the report of Christians. Because that's the report of the Lord, is it not? Whose report do you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. That's the report of the Lord is given through yeah. his people. His followers, every person in here, every person in here, Jesus prayed for you personally, and his prayer is that they're going to stay the course, that you and I are going to dig in deep in our prayer lives and pray effectively and fervently, and that we'll take the access to God through the blood, his blood that is about to be shed. I mean, he is about to be arrested. He's about to be betrayed by one of those closest to him. It's right before the betrayal. This is when he's praying. The three prayer, prayers of Jesus. His prayer for himself. That God be glorified in him. His prayer for his men. He's saying, they, they've kept your word, God. And they're not perfect. We can read, man. They are simply not perfect. I don't know about you, but when I read about his men, I get lots of hope. Because I'm, sometimes just when they're doing something so incredibly spiritual, they also turn around and do something so incredibly stupid. I'm like, now that I can relate with. I can get behind that. But he said, they have kept thy word. Because Jesus taught them how to access the very throne room of God. Jesus is talking about the future believers who will come to know him. And we are that future, you and I. See, this is the effect of prayer. Because Jesus' prayers are answered here tonight. We look around, the prayers of Jesus Christ on that day, in that moment, in that very hour, are answered in every person that is sitting here tonight that has the blood of Jesus, of forgiveness and covering of sin upon their lives. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing that is. What a wonderful testimony of prayer that is. Does our prayer life reflect that? When we're in the prayer room praying, are we, are we praying like that? Because if we're not, you know, we can be. Amen. It's not an accusation, because I felt it. Man. As soon as I asked that question, I mean, I, I felt in my spirit a wholehearted no. <laughs> right? And you know why? Because I have to ask myself that question, and the answer is no. Survey says, <laughs> right? Yeah. But instead of going, well, but why bother? No, no, no. See, now's the time to go in there, take off your jacket, go in there and roll up the sleeves. Go in there and put on the spiritual brass knuckles that God has given us simply because we have the blood of Jesus and start pounding upon the enemy and start turning the battle back at the gates so that the gates of hell cannot prevail against this house of God that God has established. Hallelujah. That's our prayer life. That's what we can have in prayer, man. We ought to be excited to get to prayer. We ought to be looking for, man, I can't wait to get to prayer. Man, anybody who's ever gone to conference, I remember when I first went to Prescott Conference, man, it, it, I started walking up to the prayer tent, and it was, I heard this, yeah. like this song. And I walked in, it was like, you don't know what's shutting out on it, you don't know, no, no, God, you're going to have to, Lord, you're just going to have to, Father, you're just going to have to, I heard all kinds of things. I heard 10-year-olds going, God, you got to do it. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, God, you do, God. I was inspired. I was inspired. And I would love to say that my prayer life has reflected that every day since then. But you know what? It hasn't. Sometimes, man, it's down here. If you and I will simply plug in, instantly we can be jump-started in our prayer life. There's things to do. There's things to find. There's things to loose. There's yeah. cities to be won. There yeah. are souls to be oh, won. There are churches oh, no. to build. There is eternal life for people still yet to be given out there. Yeah. You and I need to be praying. I want to look lastly at this scripture, Luke 22, verse 44. 
This is Jesus praying. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Doesn't that move you? <laughs> when you read that, doesn't that move you? Come on. Just think, he's, the man's praying so hard. He's, he starts bleeding almost. It's like they were great drops of blood. That's the way his sweat was. That's fervent prayer. That's glowing, hot, effectual prayer, able to produce a desired result. Jesus has given us the prime example of how to approach our prayer life. If we want to see revival, we've got to pray like that. If we want to see things break, bound in our life, if we want to see salvation loosed in our houses, in our churches, yeah. we've got to start praying like that. Yeah. Can we commit to that tonight? Yeah. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Respect of God and the revelation that he's given us tonight. Listen, I know that we have all, in one form or fashion, heard this sermon before. I'm under no delusion. I'm not going to step in and preach a sermon that the pastor's never touched on. I guarantee you, pastor preaches on prayer all the time. All the time. The reason why is because we need it. We need to be reminded, listen, every person in here can pray like a boss, man. Every person in here can pray like Jesus because he said we can. Well, I don't like to pray out loud. Okay, don't pray out loud, but let's see some sweat. Well, I got to scream to the heavens. Fine, scream as loud as you want, but let's see some fervency. Let's see some sweat, man. Let's, let's see some honesty in prayer. Well, I can't pray around others. Well, then it's time to learn. Pray that God will help you pray around others. Hallelujah. Because there's strength in the body of believers when they pray together. If your prayer closet at home is nothing but a, a storage place now because you filled it with other things, you can go home tonight and empty that prayer closet out, that place that was once sanctified to the Lord and an altar was built, and you can re-sanctify it just like that by simply praying, God, re-anoint my prayer life, and He will. God, help us if this is just a, a feel-good moment in the Lord. And then we go back to business as usual tomorrow. Our prayer life needs to revolutionize. And you know what? It always needs to revolutionize. You know, before we can pray for anything, before we can contend for anything, before we can ask God to do one thing, we must get the access, the door to heaven. And that's Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you're hearing this, you're in this place and you're not saved, you're here at home and you're not saved, you've never said a prayer of repentance. I want to talk to you for just a moment. I know there are people bound by all kinds of horrible things. I was bound by drugs and perversion and anger. I'm suicidal. I was bound by hate, bitterness, and unforgiveness. But Jesus set me free, and it's not because I'm special. It's not because I deserve it, and I sure didn't earn it. I just got tired of my life and I said something's got to be different. And maybe you're watching right now, or you're in this place right now, and you're saying, you know what, that's me. I'm tired of being that way. I'm tired of it. I want to get saved. If you're in this place, lift your hand where I can see it. Never said a prayer of repentance, I'm pray. If you're at home, stand by for just a moment. I'm going to pray because I want to talk to somebody else for a moment. I want to talk to backsliders. You're backslidden. You're in this place, or you're at home. You're apart from God, and you know it. You've allowed sin to separate you from God again. There are people who will say, oh, no one can pluck me from the hand of the Father. And you know, that is absolutely true. But God gives us a choice. We can leave the hand of the Father any time we want. We can leave the hand of the Father by mistake. We can make mistakes. We can make a wrong choice. You know, being in the hand of the Father and being covered in grace is not an excuse to go back and live in sin. And it can happen. It can happen. And start off that way. We're trying to. It's not that you don't believe God exists. It's not that you hate God. Just made a mistake. 
And then it became a pattern of mistakes. And the next thing you know, you're out of the will of God. You're apart from God. You're separated from God. Never from His love. For God so loved the world and everybody in it that He sent Jesus. The love is still there. But His will is not being realized because of sin, because of rebellion, because of choices that we made. If that's you, you're in this place while nobody's looking around, heads bowed, eyes are closed. I want you to slip your hand up where I can see it. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care if you hold a ministry in the church. You're a ministry leader. You're, you're the most faithful person in God. If you're apart from God, I'm talking to you right now. Because God is the one you should be concerned about, not what anybody else would think. If anybody has a problem with you getting saved, if anybody laughs or points or mocks, then they need to be up here getting saved. Shame on them. They need Jesus. If that's you, slip your hand up. I'm going to pray. I just want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Give me the microphone. Have you talked to the congregation? I've been many of that. I just want to pray with you. If you're in this place, if you're in that, we'll pray. Hallelujah. Maybe you're at home right now. You're watching this. You are a backslider. And you've been feeling the conviction. Maybe it was conviction you got during this night of watching service. Maybe it's conviction that you've had before this and, and God's been dealing with you and you've been feeling the, the, the thumb of God pressing upon you and you've been resisting because you've been saying things to yourself like, well, I, don't, I know as soon as I pray, I'm going to go right back to the same old things. And the devil is just accusing you out of your salvation. He's accusing you out of getting saved because he's telling you you can't do it. Because you prayed 1,000 times and, and always went back. Well, pray 1,001 and trust God to deliver you tonight and help you because he will. He loves you, my friend. He loves you. His arms are open wide for you right now. He loves you just as much as he always did. I want to pray with you. Anyone else in this place? If you're at home, you're not saved or you're backslidden, I want you to say this prayer. I want you to repeat it after me. Say it out loud. I want you to say, Father God, I know that I am a sinner. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again after three days. And I ask you into my heart, Jesus, to be my personal Lord and my Savior. God, forgive me of all my sins. I thank you for your grace and your mercy that changed my life right here, right now. I want to live for you. Help me to do it in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it, you meant it. You just wanted it. I'm not saying you feel all the confidence in the world. I'm saying you meant it, though, from your heart of hearts. You said, oh, boy, I'm so tired. If you meant that God is going to begin to help you right now. Maybe nothing caught on fire and called your name. Maybe the earth didn't shake, but oh, God's going to begin to make himself real to you. He's going to begin to speak and whisper into your spirit. You're going to begin to feel conviction about things. Listen, that's God. And God's not going to take something from you and leave you with a hole in your life. He's going to replace it with something good, something holy, something pleasing, to where you don't need that worldly stuff. He's going to help you live for Him. He's not just going to wait and check in sometime later. He's going to be with you every day, every moment. Get a hold of the pastor here, Pastor Marcos Colon. He's a good, good man who came here to start a church. He came here because he loves people, and God is moving through his ministry. You can be a part of that ministry. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody else that's in this place, I want to open the altar. You just come find a place to pray. If there's no room at the altar when you get here, just turn around and hit a seat that's available and pray. But let's let's come to the altar. Let's establish the throne of God. Let's pray. This is what we've been talking about this whole service. Let's come to this altar and pray. Really pray. Not do time at the altar. Not just come in and and say a couple of words and split. No, let's come before the Lord and let's begin to pray. God, let your light shine through me, God, that I may impact a world that's lost and dying. Oh, God, speak to my spirit, Lord, and then speak to others. I am an ambassador, God, for you. Touch heaven tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ba ba ba.
sound like what your perception of the oracle of the Lord ought to sound like. Listen, man, sometimes when I'm praying, my prayer goes a lot like this. God, I am just really stupid. Would you help me, Jesus name? Amen. Hey, man, it's an honest prayer from the heart. Sometimes I come in, I don't even know what I need to pray for, but I'm troubled in my spirit. I don't have any peace. And I'm just like, God, you just have to show me what's troubling me and help me to pray against it. I know you're the answer for it. See, whatever you're feeling, you can pray in your feeling, and God will bring deliverance. If you're sad, God will give you joy. If you're angry, God will give you peace. Because that's what God longs to do. He wants our prayer lives to be effective. You can touch heaven with your prayer. You've got a lot of stuff you want to pray for. But you've begun to believe that you're not articulate. I've heard you say it. Well, I can't articulate what I'm thinking. I can't articulate what I'm thinking. Well, keep trying. Keep doing it. 
do the best you can. When you, as long as you're doing your best, best is best. Yeah. And when you talk to God, he'll take your best. He'll take it. He's not laughing at, at any words you can't say or because you get jumbled in your mind. He ain't laughing at you. He's like, no, no, keep talking. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. Because there's a lot that's in there that wants yeah. to come out and touch people. And you have the ability to do it. Okay, you just got a case of the cans. You got a case of the comparisons. You look around, you compare yourself to other people and say, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that. God's not asking you to be brother so-and-so. He's not asking you to do like brother so-and-so. He's asking you to be the best kind of that you can be. Yeah. You be God's kind, of, and he's going to use you powerfully. He loves yeah. you. He's helping you. He's not angry with you. He's looking forward to blowing the door off of your prayer life, brother. Yeah. God, God wants me to tell you, he's got you, man. Just start, just start doing it. Don't wait, but just start doing it. And do the best you can. Watch what God's going to do. Can I pray for you? Father, I pray for Kai right now, God. I pray, Lord, touch you, God. I pray, Lord, as he received this word and applies it to his life, God. I pray, O oh Lord, that you help him, God. Strengthen him, O oh Lord. Let him see, God, that you're with him every step of the way. God, I pray, Lord, give him confidence in you, God. Courage and boldness from on high, my God. Lord, use him powerfully as you already have, God. Build upon that, my God. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is good. God is good. Brother, God's going to make himself real to you in ways that you, you, you weren't even ready for. Because sometimes it's really easy to, to just think we know what God's trying to do. But God's saying, nope, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. i got something bigger in store for you. But I'm going to have to make you feel uncomfortable first. And God's all about making people uncomfortable. Not because he hates us, not because he's out to get us, not because he's laughing at us, but because he knows if he doesn't make us uncomfortable, we won't strive to do something more. Okay? God wants me to tell you that he'll do things in you. He's going to break some bondages in your life. But he's also going to lose some things that are glorious in your life. But he's going to start talking to you. He's going to start saying, you know, probably need to put that down. Probably need to cut that off. Okay? And when he does, don't fight it. Don't resist it. Don't rebuke it. Well, get, get behind the devil because it's not the devil, it's God. Okay? And even when he does it, you'll know. You'll know. You'll know. I'm telling you, you'll know. When he does it, just embrace it, receive it. Talk to God, talk to him. Talk to Pastor, just talk to him. Just, just be real with him, talk to him. Because God is fixing to blow your socks off, then. And I'll just say that because I'm supposed to. Okay? I don't know you, you don't know me, you don't know each other, but we know God. And God's wanting me to tell you that he's going to cut some things off in your life, let him do it. And he's going to take you places quick. He's going to put in some things in your life. Is this making sense to you? You should just repent it. I know you just got saved. And glory to God. And I know that feels good. It's going to feel gooder. <laughs> Amen. Can I pray for you real quick? Okay, come over here. Sometimes as men, we get, we get, uh, we don't like failure. That's what it is. Men don't like to fail. But most of the time, it's how we learn our lessons. Okay. And so what happens is fear of failure keeps us from trying. Things different because we're afraid we're going to look bad, we're going to laugh, or whatever. You know, later for all that, man. Later for all that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've dropped the ball. I did it right in front of everybody. But you know, God says, you fall down, keep running. Righteous man falls seven times when he gets back up. Okay, so God wants me to tell you, don't be afraid of failure. Don't go sit on the bench. You start to put you in the game, man. Because he's going to give you the ball and let you run with it. You agree with that? Hallelujah. All right, I'm God, I pray right now for my brother God. I pray, Lord, that you help me receive this word, God. All these things, Almighty God, that you want him to let go of, my God. I pray, Lord, that you bring down upon him with conviction and comfort, God, and challenge him, Lord, to receive your word, God. I throw down right now any religion, Almighty God, anything, Lord, that is doctrine, God, that is trying dead, Lord. I'm asking you, God, to replace it with the living word, God, your living doctrine, my God. Lord, your peace and your power, God. Let his faith be in you completely. Let him strive in the supernatural, God. I pray, Lord, make yourself real to him, oh God, in every way, God. Touch his heart. Change him, Lord, from the inside out and give him courage. Shake out of that and us on that. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord praise. Oh God, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. I want to do something real different before we dismiss. I'm going to ask everybody to just take your seats for just a moment. We're not going to take long with this, and, and I know there's always a danger, especially when you talk to preachers. Uh, we can all you know, just keep going, so we're going to keep this short and sweet. But I would like to ask every pastor in the room to stand. Every pastor in the room to just stand here. And sing your favorite song starting with that. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, what I would ask is that each pastor just, just very quickly and concisely tell us what you want to see. Pastor Marcus, what do you want to see? Disciples. Disciples. Hallelujah. Pastor Fred. Disciples. Glory to God. Pastor Larry. Disciples. Pastor Sean. Revival. Revival. Come on, somebody. Disciple and revivals. Guess what? It's all birthed with that. Now, who is going to agree with these men in prayer. Stand. Who's going to agree with these men in prayer? If you don't agree, stay sitting. <laughs> okay. So what we're saying now, for all of us that have stood tonight, you've heard what's number one on their hearts. And you know, they didn't say security for myself. They didn't say, you know, no trouble in my life. I want my worries to be behind me and I'm going to, you know, Pack my troubles in my old kit bag and smile, 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 and take off down the sunny side of the street. You know, she didn't hear any of that. It was for others. God, let me see men rise up, disciples. Pastor Sean says, wants to see revival. Hallelujah. I mean, well, that's all connected. And now we've all just agreed to agree with these men in prayer. So now our prayer lives need to reflect that. So in just a moment, we're going to begin to pray. We're going to begin to pray as a group, as a body of believers. We're going to pray. And we're going to ask God to answer these prayers. And touch heaven with your prayer. Shout it to the rooftops. If you're one of those quiet prayers, tonight be different. Tonight be different. Just be different tonight. Just be different. Everybody's going to shout tonight. Nobody's going to really hear you necessarily. But God will. Hallelujah. God will. And watch God begin to answer this prayer because now we're going to double down. Not just tonight. Today is the beginning of a revived prayer life. Hallelujah. And God's people and God's churches and these churches are going to grow to be lighthouses in the coming darkness. And people are going to be attracted to these houses like moths to flame. Fire attracts people. Hallelujah. And it's going to spread. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's begin the prayer church. Tell God what you want. Tell him what you want. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Mighty God, we are asking God. We're going to raise men, God. Bring disciples, oh Lord God. Raise up men, God. Preach the gospel. Raise up men, my God. Who can stand, oh God. Who can defend. Who can be the author of their pastors, God. Men who will put themselves to the side, oh God. Men who will lay down. God's dealing with somebody to interpret. Speak it out. Don't think. Just speak. Speak. You've got it. You know you do. Begin to praise God one more time. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Revival is what we need. Amen. Amen. The way I learned to pray, man, I didn't know how to pray. The only prayer I knew was our Father who art in heaven, Hail Mary, and had a, all, all the chickens had a praise. Amen. That's the only prayer I knew until I came into the potter's house. Amen. Came into a prayer room here in my pasture. Amen. That's what taught me how to pray. Was sitting next to my pastor. Amen. If you, if you don't know how to pray or you never heard pray, amen, sit next to your pastor or your pastor's wife. Amen. Yes. Amen. They will teach you how to pray. You, my, my pastor's spirit jumped on me. And I, I learned how to pray after that. Amen. From, from that moment, amen, I started getting a hold of God. I seen God move, amen. And through your prayer life, what I tell my church all the time, your prayer life is your relationship with God. Yes. Because without it, you don't have a relationship with God. Amen. You have got to, that's how you build your relationship with God. Amen. Hey, pray. Get a hold of God. I, I heard, a, I heard a, a, a quote from Denzel Washington. I, I don't believe he's saved, but he said something very profound. He says, before you go to bed at night, get down on your knees and pray and get a hold of God. And he says, whenever you're done praying, get your slippers and tuck them deep under your bed. And the first thing you do when you get up in the morning, you have to get down on your knees to look for them slippers. And that while you're on your knees, get a hold of God. Amen. Because you need prayer. Amen. You, we need God in our life. Amen. We need God every day. We need our relationship with God. Amen. God moves. Amen. Whenever you get a hold of God. Amen. Let's get a hold of God. Amen. Go to the prayer room. Amen. Tomorrow at your church. Amen. Have your prayer room roaring. Amen. The neighbors across the street, what's that noise? Amen. They want to come in. What they want is, what is that? Yeah. Amen. The book of Acts. They, they came. And they heard the noise. Amen. They, yeah. What is that? That revival broke out in the book of Acts. I believe revival will break out. Amen. When the saints of God get a hold of God. When the saints of God move, amen. And they come and revival will break out. Let's believe that this evening. Amen. Let's believe for revival in our cities. Amen. In our churches. Amen. We have Pastor Fred close us in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks to you, Lord, my God, Lord, for your word that is personal, that is there for us to seek you out when we pray, my God, Lord, that you just help us, my God, to continue in prayer fervently and effectively, my God. We just ask, Lord, for your will to be done most of all. We are contending, Lord, for people to see your glory in our lives. We just love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.